Well, we'll kick off, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. A small but select group. Uh, so we'll put it on video so that the rest of the world can see it if they should choose to do so. So I thought for this presentation today it would be good to just get some uh, ideas uh, collected uh, around uh, what's happening in uh, the Korean Peninsula in terms of cyber activities. Uh, cyber war is probably a slightly too strong term. But also I wanted to put that in the context of Australian policy a little bit uh, and also in the context of what do developments in cyber activities in the Korean Peninsula represent for us in terms of an intelligence analysis problem and an Australian policy problem. So that's really where we're going. Uh, and sort of several main sort of takeaways from today really or, or in a sense ways of looking at the problem. Uh, the first one is that we're in the midst of an information revolution and everything changes as a result of the information revolution. So in a sense if we want to make an assessment about the Korean Peninsula, uh, it's probably got to look different and sound different from what it looked like 10 years ago because of the impact of cyber uh, activities. Uh, and perhaps you'll we'll appreciate that more as we go through. And the second point builds off that. Uh, the key intelligence questions we need to ask about the Korean Peninsula and even the force planning questions uh, need to factor in adversary use of cyber assets. And it, in a sense, not just take it as one more of a long list of considerations, but where an adversary is determined to exploit cyber assets um, in a committed and determined way, we have to sort of, in a sense, I think, give it a higher priority. A third point, and I don't want to overplay this, but I think we do have to accept that South Korean assets in Australia, people, South Korean people in Australia, and even South Korean aircraft are potential targets of disabling cyber attack. And uh, that's not something that's been sort of canvassed much, so I think that's worth taking away. I certainly don't want to overplay it. Uh, I'll get back to the proposition that the uh, number of attacks, uh, cyber attacks that North Korea has launched has actually been quite small uh, overall, um, although when the South Korean government puts out figures they have large numbers, you know, thousands, uh, but we can't, wouldn't imagine, for example, that the frequency of a North Korean attack on South Korean assets in Australia would be anything like the frequency we're seeing of uh, Islamic State sympathisers plotting attacks in Australia, which is like four or, four or five a year. I think the frequency of this is sort of quite low, and the likelihood quite low. But I think we do have to plan for it. We have to understand, in a sense, uh, what that would look like so that we can prepare for it. Leaving the Australian scene and going back to sort of bigger global scene, I think that uh, one thing that the North Korean situation tells us is that the idea of um, a cyber Pearl Harbor, which was canvassed some years ago and which most governments have now walked away from, um, is probably not what we should be looking for. So I think there's quite a good global consensus around that. But I think we should start to think about what does a cyber Fukushima look like or a cyber Twin Towers. And the relevance of the cyber Fukushima will go through a bit when we talk about nuclear power stations. Uh, but the thing about cyber twin towers is really an allusion to the proposition that we knew for a number of years that Al-Qaeda was there, they had published their manifestos, they had launched attacks, but there was complete surprise at the method of attack. And I think in cyberspace, since there are so many possible vectors of attack and even bigger number of, of, of targets, we really do need to be thinking about a cyber twin towers. Now, to kick off, we all know the Thomas Ridd book, Cyber War Will Not Take Place. I agree with his general proposition, as he defines it, where you've got an enemy lined up against another one, an adversary, and they're both attacking themselves, each other, only in cyberspace. I don't believe uh, that that's a likelihood, uh, and uh, I think there's a general consensus behind Ridd's proposition. But, so I'm just using the word cyber war loosely in the title. But you can see from this interview with uh, David Sanger, who's a leading journalist with the New York Times, who broke the story in early March this year about US cyber attacks on North Korean ballistic missiles, he believes that we've got an active cyber war underway between uh, the North Koreans uh, and South Korea and between the North Koreans and the United States. Uh, and I think that this um, is an interesting uh, point of reference if we just take the term cyber war a little bit loosely. 
and, and the essence of what uh, Sanger is saying is that uh, there are determined, destructive uses of force by North Korea uh, in this active cyber war. And if we believe his reports about the United States attacks on uh, North Korean ballistic missiles, that is a use of force. Uh, so we have use of force on both sides. I don't think there's any evidence that I've seen to speak of South Korean use of force against North Korea, although I have seen some discussion uh, of it in respect of cyberspace. Uh, I think the evidence is just too thin. Regardless of the frequency of the attacks uh, in the K Korean Peninsula, uh, and in the sense the proposition that they haven't risen to uh, all-out kinetic conflict, um, might disguise the proposition that I want to put on the table right now, and that is that uh, we are seeing the Korean Peninsula and the Korean conflict as a bit of a testbed of cyber conflict. And almost anyone who's written about it frames it up like that, but they don't quite arrive at the Spanish Civil War analogy. And the point of going back to the Spanish Civil War is not to suggest that we're on the eve of some conflagration like World War II, but it's to put the proposition on the table that governments learn and governments want to test their military equipment, they want to test the use of force uh, and it may be contestable but I think we have to understand that the use by uh, Germany, Italy and the Soviet Union of assets in the Spanish Civil War might have had an impact on their decision making uh, for the war uh, or in how that all unfolded. We should uh, accept that what's happening on the Korean Peninsula in cyberspace is being watched very closely by Russia and China. I have very deep interest in it. Uh, so I've written a paper with a Russian colleague, in fact, on uh, how the Russians view US capability to attack ballistic missiles either before launch or in flight. Uh, and both Russia and China are on record as saying that this capability uh, is a threat to strategic stability. Uh, the Russians more directly, the Chinese say it less explicitly. So we can be alarmed, I think. Uh, so we, we, we note the testbed idea, we note the Russians and the Chinese are watching closely. Uh, we do need to call out specifically the proposition from the Russian point of view and from the Chinese point of view that what the United States is doing militarily in the Korean Peninsula, uh, including in cyberspace, is a direct, has a direct impact on their security at the highest level of strategic stability. And there's statements on the record from the Chinese and Russian governments to that effect um, in different ways uh, and in doctrinal statements in December, both in December last year. We also need to call out the potential for cyber terrorism involving civil nuclear facilities. And I didn't bring it with me, but the, there was a uh, press statement from October last year from the director of the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, saying that there was a serious cyber attack, attempted cyber attack against a nuclear power station uh, several years ago. He has no more details. But um, I did work on this with um, the East West Institute in New York. We did interviews with uh, key players in the United States civil nuclear industry. Uh, we wrote a paper and briefed it to the Nuclear Knowledge Summit in 2014. Uh, this is a serious problem. Uh, and uh, while we shouldn't overplay the real sort of probability in a sense, uh, it is an important uh, issue that needs to be on the table. And that's why I've got this little uh, graphic uh, uh, sp splattered throughout the presentation. We can take uh, as an authority for the proposition that cyber attack on civil nuclear power plants is a real and present danger from the US government's law of war manual which was published in uh, mid-2015 which says that civil nuclear power stations and dams are legitimate targets in war. Now, I interpret that the way the Americans intended, that that is highly unlikely and would only happen in the event of extreme military 
circumstances. But it's there in paper that uh, it's a legitimate target in war. I also interpret from what I understand of the United States civilised approach to these matters is that the best way to disable a civil nuclear power station in war is by cyber attack. So if you bomb a civil nuclear power station, you might have a wayward bomb and release of radiation. If you use a controlled cyber attack, you've got a chance of shutting down the power, which is a military purpose that the United States would be looking for. The United States would not be looking for release of radiation. So there's enough study around uh, that we do have to take very seriously as a strategic actor the proposition that the security of the 23 nuclear power stations in South Korea are in play because of cyber attack or potential cyber attack. We should also um, take note of the fact that according to the US government, North Korea turned to much more attention on offensive cyber ops in 2014 and then we have this attack on the uh, power company that supervises um, uh, many of these nuclear reactors in South Korea. Now this attack was not against the reactors themselves, it wasn't against the safe operations, but the Korean government interpreted it as a terror attack uh, and there's um, some useful detail in a study by two Koreans on exactly what unfolded, but the proposition that the North Koreans directly threatened to uh, affect the safe operations of three of the nuclear power stations in Korea. We do have to take note of that. They released the details of 10,000 employees of the nuclear power plants in South Korea. Uh, this was a direct intimidation of them. Uh, it warned them not to go to work. Uh, so, of course, um, being good patriots, I presume most of them went. So this idea of the Korean Peninsula is an important testbed of emerging military technologies and uncertain strategic interactions, I think, is something we bear in mind. It, it adds to the unpredictability uh, of, the, of the scene. So I really just wanted to uh, list here on this slide the uh, cyber attacks that have occurred uh, on the Korean Peninsula. So these are not all North Korean, obviously. And I've put the United States one at the top, uh, not because it's meant to be any criticism, it's really just it's the only one that we, we can sort of note that's really in the same sort of category of aggressiveness that the others um, have. Uh, I think we can be certain that the United States um, is doing interesting things to North Korea in cyberspace, but because North Korea has very limited connectivity, it's got a very small power grid, uh, which would still be vulnerable. Uh, but there is a long list of things that the North Koreans have done and that the other side is probably doing, which do create an environment of uh, conflict. David Sanger has called it cyber war. Uh, I think it's definitely cyber use of force. Uh, there's new things in play, and it's the degree of novelty that is the important dimension we need to bear in mind when we come to intelligence assessments and trying to un and predict uh, what, what's happening. And you can characterize um, that those activities over the last few years uh, in several ways. Uh, most of these attacks have occurred in the past five years. Uh, there's been an increasing destructiveness and frequency, although, as I mentioned, the number of these uh, destructive attacks uh, remains quite low, very low, in fact. But what is interesting is that uh, in the attacks on the, North Korea, sorry, on the South Korean power company, uh, that the perpetrators used up to 300 different pieces of malware. Uh, and that may be no problem to a large... Uh, 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 and sophisticated national government, but it was certainly a problem for the, the power company that was running the uh, power plants, uh, as we'll see in a minute. And it, it's also an evolution that's been observed by many in the civil sector. So there's a presentation from RSA in Singapore 2013, which put on the table the proposition that we're now facing multi-vector, multi-phase attacks in cyberspace. The idea that you can deal with one piece of malware today and maybe another one next week is just not where we're going to be at. Now, the conflict dynamics in the Korean Peninsula will shape the meaning of any of this activity in cyberspace. I couldn't possibly go through uh, all of the conflict dynamics. Uh, they're really uh, quite involved. They go right back. Uh, it is the most serious 
armed confrontation in the world. Uh, I've mentioned there the abrogation by the United States of the uh, one uh, part of the armistice agreement to allow the introduction of nuclear weapons. Not to say that the United States did the bad thing, just to say that that's what happened. Uh, so the nuclear dynamic uh, was in play early on. Uh, the other historical point there about China abandoning its plan for the military conquest of Taiwan in 1950 to enter the Korean War uh, was a really big thing for China. So imagine the Chinese communists have fought their way through the Civil War. They're in sight of the final conquest and defeat of the enemy and then their North Korean allies launch a war. Uh, and, and so Mao has to make the conscious decision, I'm going to give up the reunification of China and the conquest of Taiwan and go and fight, defend these nasty North Koreans against the Americans because we don't want the United Nations and American forces on our border. So yeah, it's really complex. Uh, but what I'd really like to sort of highlight from this uh, set of conflict dynamics is that uh, things have moved in the last um, few years and it's as an intelligence problem it's very difficult uh, but we have to uh, understand and for reasons I'll go to in a minute that uh, just exactly what those dynamics are and what are the things which are destabilizing how we might have understood the North Korean or the Korean Peninsula uh, problems uh, three or four years ago and these have we've seen some changes for the worse and we've some, seen some changes for the better for the better, I'd include the election of the new president of South Korea, but I'd also include, much to my own surprise, uh, that Donald Trump uh, instinctively appears to have created a bit of circuit breaker by calling Kim Jong-un a smart cookie. Uh, I think that gives him a tremendous amount of face. Uh, it's no coincidence in my view that after that statement, a North Korean diplomat was quoted as saying, we're prepared to talk to the United States in the right circumstances, which is what the White House said when they clarified Trump's remarks. Um, so we do have some, in a sense, restraining sort of uh, things in play. Uh, but I'm a little alarmed by the new level of destabilization. I note with great uh, satisfaction that the Defence Secretary, James Mattis, said uh, that, uh, or implied very strongly, if he didn't say it directly, that the military option is more or less off the table. Uh, we, we don't plan to solve this militarily. We've got a lot of diplomacy yet to go. Uh, however, he said that. I think that was really important. Um, but I don't think that changes the character of the North Korean regime, and I don't think it changes the way in which they address the problems. So I've alluded to this as an intelligence problem, and the, there's a book written by Richard Betts 1982, published by the Brookings Institution, which is an essential volume for anyone in intelligence. I used it in 1990 uh, when we, in my organisation, uh, took the view that Saddam Hussein was probably going to invade Kuwait in September. So we were looking at the forces on the border. And Richard um, Betts, uh, uh, in his book, Surprise Attack, pointed out, did a historical study and said that uh, when countries move forces forward to a border, it's more likely than not that they will go all the way to war. And that's a very interesting proposition. It's one that a lot of people around the world didn't sort of quite appreciate when they're trying to understand in September 1990 why, what was Saddam's intent when he moved those forces up to the border. But the more interesting uh, problem that Betts addresses in that book is the wolf at the door problem. And this is the situation where you've got an adversary who's repeatedly saying, I will attack. And my first experience of North Korea saying it will attack was 41 years ago. And they haven't, the, those, uh, re, those assurances of attack, imminent attack, haven't sort of ceased, um, even if they've gone away for a week or two. The other problem related to that is that the North Korean forces are at the start line. So you've got a really big wolf at the door problem if you've got a country that's been saying I'm going to attack <coughs> for over 40 or 50 years, you've got large armed forces on the border in high states of readiness, and you've got this sort of rec uh, rhetoric of, uh, or these the sort of provocative activities from time to time. And what that means as for policy analysts or intelligence analysts is that you can't monitor war changes in war rhetoric or changes in force deployments for <coughs> signs of attack. So you more or less denied that, op that option. So unlike 1990, where we could see the Iraqi forces move from their prior locations up to the Kuwait border, 
we, can't, we won't get that opportunity necessarily in Korea. Uh, and we've got these repeated threats, so we don't know um, if the one time when Kim Jong-un Jong -un says, I'm going to attack, uh, we don't know whether uh, he means it or it's the same as the last 50 years of threats that didn't eventuate. And where that drives us is we've got to try and understand motivators of the, of the adversary. And that's uh, very hard, but it's not impossible. Uh, and the motivators for the adversary are shaped in part by the success of application of different instruments of power. So what I'm saying, going back to this testbed idea, that if Kim Jong-un gets the idea that he can do things with cyber attack that are useful, give him a great sense of joy for whatever, at whatever level for being able to disrupt uh, South Korean activities, uh, then um, that's the sort of motivator we need to be bringing into play as well as some of the broader political considerations. I also wanted to put on the table the proposition that in the Korean theatre, it's not just the two Koreas and the United States that are cyber actors. Now, it would be almost impossible for us to sketch out the way in which the other countries are actors. Uh, we know, for example, from multiple sources that North Korean hackers seem to operate from inside China. Uh, that must be with some knowledge and uh, forbearance of the Chinese government. Uh, we don't really have much of a clue of what the Japanese, in the public domain, what the Japanese Russians uh, are doing. Uh, the North Korean missile program and the North Korean nuclear program arose because of the involvement of foreigners. The North Koreans could not have done it without foreigners. So I think it's only reasonable to assume that their cyber security forces are riddled with foreigners, uh, both working in place in North Korea and abroad. Uh, so we have to try and understand, well, will they be Chinese, will they be Russians, will they be Iranians or Pakistanis? So the Iranian, the North Korean nuclear weapons, uh, or nuclear capability, the testing capability, the, making the, the um, test device, was uh, shaped in part, apparently, according to a number of sources, by the AQ Khan network from Pakistan. So I think there's enough history of relations between China, Russia, Iran and Pakistan and North Korea to think that there must be some connection between those countries and what's going on in cyberspace. What about Israel? Well, Israel will be watching all of this very closely. Uh, Israel does have close relations with China in some of these areas. Um, the extent is not revealed in the public domain. Uh, and India, apparently, we discovered just last year, is still training North Korean nuclear uh, technicians. Uh, India itself, I think, was this a bit surprised to discover that. Uh, but uh, it happened. So the Korean Peninsula as a cyber theatre with multiple sort of actors in play and having a global impact is something uh, also worth putting on the table. Both in terms of response, so for example, should we be coordinating more with Russia and China on the cyber stuff around North Korea um, or not? Now what is North Korea's cyber capability? Well, there's a number of defectors who talk about 6,000 cyber warriors, and um, there are also people who say, don't believe anything a North Korean defector says about the size of the enemy. And in a sense, the, there's a presumed incentive to exaggerate the size of the North Korean forces for defectors when they're coming back to South Korea. Uh, but there's, in a sense, enough collateral from different sources to understand that the North Korean capability is not small. Uh, that they've got uh, a dedicated uh, process in place. Uh, unlike Australia, when the United States moved decisively towards information warfare in the mid-1990s, it appears that North Korea did as well. Um, so I think that's an important point to bear in mind. So the, what they did in the mid from the mid-1990s on was, it appears, heavily oriented around electronic warfare, but they started up their in a sense, information aids type uh, activities. Uh, they've got, uh, according to some sources, a dedicated tertiary college for cyber operations called the Command Automation University. Command Automation is their translation of command and control. Uh, and there's programs at several other universities according to the defectors. Uh, there are different names given to uh, actors who do these cyber attacks on behalf of North Korea. 
Dark Soul, Guardians of Peace. It's not clear uh, whether they're just cover names for other units or whether they're uh, discrete entities. Uh, I think I draw from that general set of information, uh, which not my original research, uh, I draw from that general set of information that uh, the activities, the offensive cyber operations by the North Koreans are small in number if that's how many people they've got doing them. Although what it tells me also, I guess, is that to mount an effective offensive cyber operation, cyber operation you need good intelligence and it needs to be compiled and rechecked and uh, in a sense it's, it's a really big intelligence job. So it's a bit hard to know really what all of that means. Uh, I think we can take, uh, we, we should have a lot of concern about the PSYOPs unit in the Korean Workers' Party, the Communist Party, if it does have 2,000 personnel, uh, cyber and non-cyber, I think we should understand in a sense, what that would look like if they really turned nasty. So we don't really know the full scale of it in the unclassified domain. Uh, it's clearly enough uh, to worry about. Uh, we can only monitor, in a sense, uh, the record of the attacks. On the other side of the fence, and just in a sense uh, labelled blue cyber forces, uh, we can talk about the South Korean ambition to get up to around 4,000 uniformed people. Uh, interestingly, South Korea, unlike Australia, also took up the information security uh, uh, and information war warfare concept in the mid-1990s, uh, perhaps because they knew what the North Koreans were doing. Uh, and they have a sort of more developed response than some countries. They've got this uh, joint military civilian cyber threat joint response team. Uh, and interestingly, they've got uh, in normal times when the country's not under any sort of cyber attack, it's a communications ministry who's in the lead. So I think if you put all, everything together, you could easily form the opinion that South Korea with its allies um, has considerable capability in cyberspace. It isn't necessarily a defense against this or that attack, uh, but it's a little bit reassuring that uh, to some degree, the South Koreans are prepared. Uh, and just how ill-prepared in some respects uh, we'll reveal in a minute. So turning a little bit towards our part of the world, we have this interesting statement from someone I've called the Prime Minister, and I guess most people will know which Prime Minister I'm talking about. Uh, but it's the proposition that a country south of the equator is affected by what's happening in cyberspace in the Korean Peninsula, and that we should reasonably expect uh, that um, a country like Australia and New Zealand uh, might reasonably be impacted by these activities. And I can only presume that the Australian government um, has had a bit of a look at this, uh, but if I was the Korean government, I'd be talking to the Australian government about how to protect Korean assets in Australia in the very unlikely event of some sort of attack. But um, since the internet is a global uh, thing and cyberspace is global, we in Australia can't take any comfort from the fact that the North Koreans don't have a missile that can reach us. I want to put this in the context of the evolving military relationship between South Korea and Australia. Uh, this is something that's a little bit under the radar. It's not surreptitious, but it's just a little bit under the radar as far as most people in the Australian uh, public would be concerned. So for example, we've um, had uh, activities, joint activities with the Korean Armed Forces. Uh, several years ago, we set up a two plus two process where the Ministers of Foreign Affairs and Defence met with their counterparts from North Korea. I don't know whether that's actually continued, but I saw um, 2015 uh, that it happened. Uh, but interestingly, we joined the international investigation of the North Korean sinking of this South Korean boat called the Chosan. Uh, that's the sort of thing that North Korea notices. Uh, so, you know, we can do these things and we're fully within our right to do these things, but we shouldn't imagine that they are without consequences. And I'm sure the government doesn't think they're without consequences, but these are not consequences that have been spelled out uh, by too many people in Australia. The final point I've got there is the explicit North Korean threat of nuclear attack against Australia. They've said it. Uh, it's the wolf at the door problem. It's not a credible, uh, it's not a credible threat. Uh, you know, nobody would, would take it remotely seriously. 
but what it means is that we're very clearly on their horizon. So if the preferred form of action of the North Koreans is cyber, uh, and they've got a bit of a gripe against us, and they think Australia is completely insignificant and irrelevant, um, if they're prepared to attack the United States, as they did with Sony Pictures, if they're prepared to attack South Korea, then why wouldn't they have a go at little old Australia? So, moving from the Korean Peninsula, what's the global scene in cyberspace which might condition the way actors in the Korean Peninsula deal with the opportunities and threats in cyberspace? Well, we see this escalation, sadly. Uh, and uh, most recently, in 2016, uh, attacks on the Ukraine power grid, uh, the attack on the domain name system provider, attacks on the US and French elections, widespread destructive attacks on Saudi computers, uh, and we don't know whether WannaCry was state-sponsored yet. Uh, I think that's a pretty worrying scene. And what it says to somebody like Kim Jong-un is probably that, well, everybody's doing it and they're getting away with it. So is that what he's thinking? We just have to wonder what that sort of spike in state-sponsored sabotage and uh, is what impact that would have on someone like him. And in the civil sector, what's happening? Well, we see the same sort of intensification. Uh, uh, and this, uh, this, this is data from the Symantec annual threat report published um, earlier this year. Uh, I think they're pretty sort of intimidating sorts of statistics. Uh, for example, average time to attack for a newly connected IoT device is two minutes, uh, <coughs> which is, means these sort of uh, bots are sort of running around trying to sort of connect to anything they can find. One of the interesting aspects of the Symantec report was that they noted a move away in 2016, a move away from more sophisticated cyber attack tools. Uh, clearly recognition that the old simple ones still work. And that, that's in itself uh, an important uh, uh, fact which we need to bear in mind. So the two slides together paint a picture of a deteriorating situation for the security of cyberspace internationally uh, and a reasonable conclusion that anybody could draw that if you're a state-sponsored actor or a criminal, there's a very little chance that you're going to get caught, uh, especially if you're back behind uh, an iron curtain of some sort. So the, the really scary part of the South Korean situation is how they dealt with and continue to deal with the attack on the nuclear power company. Uh, and there's a very good study by two Korean scientists, uh, computer scientists as far as I could tell, Lee and Lim. Uh, it's a great story. I totally, uh, I'm happy to give you the reference if you need it. But if you Google Lee and Lim and uh, South Korean nuclear power, you'll get it. Uh, what they found was that uh, large-scale cyber security defects in their nuclear system, not only the company, but also in the plants, um, which had been identified as early as 2012, were completely unaddressed in the period between the, uh, that review and the recommendations and the attack. They also found that the leading executives of the power company were engaged actively in fraudulent representation of the cybersecurity audits. So you can't trust the people who run the Korean power company with the 23 nuclear power stations to be honest with anybody about the cybersecurity in their power stations. That was a pretty big wake-up call. One year after the attack, they found that there were still, in that power company, in the power stations, 77 cases that violated network separation policy. Though the principle being that the air gapping that ha happens in nuclear power stations protects against most cybersecurity threats. It doesn't protect against all, it protects against most cybersecurity threats. Even after the attack from North Korea, even after all this public outcry, even after it's being labelled as a cyber terrorism, after 10,000 South Korean uh, nuclear power workers were threatened, um, the company still can't institute a, a sensible uh, regime. And another important finding is that uh, this one around administrative policy is as important as technical policy. So it's saying, as everyone in the room probably appreciates, that what you do in how you organise your personnel, your business structures, your review mechanisms, 
um, is every bit as important for cybersecurity as knowing what the threat looks like and, um, and in a sense, countering the threat with ones and zeros. So going a little bit sort of broader in their analysis of what went wrong um, in Korea uh, the, with the power plant, at, uh, power company attack, uh, the Lee and Lim make some conclusions which are of utmost relevance to all governments in the world uh, uh, and uh, is certainly the case in Australia. Uh, that first bullet point is definitely applicable to Australia. We have a, a, a public position that the responsibility for critical infrastructure pr protection in Australia is a shared responsibility. We don't say, is it a 70-30 share, a 90-10 share, and who's in charge? Uh, in the Korean case, they identified limitations of the National Cyber Control Tower, which is really their central uh, cybersecurity command centre. Uh, and without sort of going into the detail of their case, and without going into the, the detail, which I don't know of the case in other countries, uh, I think it's something that we should just have a very close look at. Another one is the absence of manuals on cyber crises. Uh, I think I can say 95% in Australia, we don't have such a manual. Um, uh, sort of, you get that feeling from between the lines where we're at. It was only early this year that the Australian government announced uh, a new effort to improve the cyber security of our critical infrastructure. And in a sense, it was almost a call for proposals and a call for partners. It wasn't really, in a sense, giving a clear lead on either the seriousness of the problem or uh, a direction on, on solutions. Two quite alarming things about the crisis uh, in the Korean power company. You can imagine that if executive directors of a company are prepared to fraudulently misrepresent the results of cybersecurity audits, that there might have been some big problems in the company in this general area. And uh, uh, Lee and Lim found that the, throughout the crisis, the company didn't have full situation awareness they only found out some things about the character and depth of the attack uh, many months afterwards after other people uh, brought it to their attention. And uh, al alarmingly from the point of view of Lee and Lim, the company maintained this stoic, uh, we did nothing wrong approach throughout the crisis, saying that uh, all of the nuclear facilities were secure because they were air-gapped. Uh, when in fact, as they were speaking and saying that every second day um, there was evidence clear evidence that the air gap had been breached. So switching uh, tack to Australia a bit, uh, I've more or less flagged the ideas here that uh, if North Korea was going to do anything against Australia, it would be more likely a cyber attack. Uh, the nuclear military threat is just simply not credible. Uh, but then we need to think about well, what would be the primary targets of a North Korean cyber attack in Australia. A, it might be unlikely, but B, in a sense, we have to have a sense of it. Uh, and I think we can safely conclude that if the North Korean government was prepared to assassinate half of the Korean cabinet in Burma uh, in the 1980s, then it wouldn't be opposed to launching a cyber attack against a visiting Korean personality in Australia. Um, a civil aviation attack uh, would be possible. Uh, other in Korean institutions or people in Australia. And I really just parked that idea. Uh, it's not worth developing too much. Um, it wouldn't be worth a lot of policy attention in Australia, you know, based on the balance of risk and probability. But I think if we're trying to academically understand what's in play here, uh, we just need to do that. Okay, so Dan Tian, the Minister for Cybersecurity, in a speech to the Press Club in November 2016, made the first Australian government admission that everything in cyberspace was not manageable. Uh, and he said the Australian public had to be prepared for a cyber storm. Uh, and that was an important change in rhetoric. It's one that we had argued for, uh, and he made it. But in a sense, um, I'd like to take you back to the proposition that uh, it's not a digital Pearl Harbor we need to prepare for, it's probably a digital, a cyber Fukushima or a cyber Twin Towers. And so the Australian government's sort of rhetoric has shifted, the policy and strategy has shifted, but I don't think we're quite where we need to be in understanding the malevolence and potential of some of these international actors. People who've read some of my work in the last year or so might be tired of hearing about this idea of a cyber reserve for Australia. 
but um, of note, uh, I was just reading through some congressional testimony from May this year, this month, uh, May 10th, I think it was, uh, where um, a very well qualified gentleman made a proposal to the United States Congress to create something called US Cyber, which would be a force in uniform, disciplined force, bringing together a whole range of national assets. And this is a really interesting idea. Um, so the situation we have in Canberra uh, and in the Australian scene is that we've got really top line departments who do cyber security and, the whole, and know the scene very well. So you can say defence and foreign affairs. Um, but the Auditor General has been saying for year after year that there are other departments who don't do it well. And Australian Tax Office, which just suffered this catastrophic fraud, um, uh, doesn't have good cyber security. So if it doesn't have good cyber security, it probably doesn't have good IT knowledge. Um, and, uh, but there's a whole range of other departments. So what we have in each of these smaller departments or non-security non departments, uh, and there's a, a large number of them, uh, well-meaning cybersecurity teams reinventing the wheel, sometimes for very small numbers of staff, uh, and I think it's probably time to think about what does that national scene look like in terms of where do we locate the expertise, where do we locate the assets. There is a proposal, a journalist called me two days ago, a new proposal by the government to store all data that it owns on Australian citizens in one place. Well, that's a sort of scary thought in itself, but what we could put with that is this idea of, well, how do you consolidate your cybersecurity resources um, and, and how do you create a new balance between civil defenders and military and uniformed defenders? And I did note with interest that South Korea has a sort of reserve option. It's not uh, structured, but is one in substance, uh, and they call it, I think, the uh, joint cybersecurity operations centre, but it brings together in crisis mode representatives of civilian government, industry uh, and the military to act. Uh, I don't believe that our structure is in that very clear form just yet. So the gentleman who made this proposition about creating a new cyber reserve for the United States his name is Keeney, uh, May 10th, US uh, Senate hearings. Um, the reason he gave for having this new type of reserve force was that the majority of the victims of the current spate of low-level cyber, low cyber coercion are predominantly civilians and private businesses. And I think that, that's a pretty good logic. So we don't really have, in any countries in the West, a tight-knit mechanism for tracking uh, and defending against large-scale attacks that affect uh, the civilian sector. Another testimony at the same set of hearings, May 10th, uh, 2017, from a really well-qualified person, uh, worked in government, FBI for a long time, uh, important roles now in a private sector role, uh, made um, a set of observations about current cybersecurity practices in the United States are failing. He said, uh, we are asking private citizens and corporations to execute rocket science and engineering. The list of check, the, the things in the checklists are so long, to do any one of them well, you need to be a rocket scientist, and it is rocket science, uh, to organise all of the resources. And I can demonstrate that uh, by reference to one item in the DHS 10-point plan for cyber resilience. So they have this 10-point plan for cyber resilience review, and it's called, um, it's about managing your external dependencies. Now the idea of managing your external dependencies in cyberspace is something that in the US public discourse uh, is limited, in the scientific discourse, is limited, limited to about three of the United States National Laboratories. You can, if you Google this term, uh, and related terms you find almost nothing elsewhere, except in DHS. DHS um, has been undergoing a process of review of US corporations involved in uh, executing the 10-point cyber resilience review uh, process, which they can do just simply by inviting DHS in. And it was a relatively small sample, perhaps over 100 corporations, but the DHS graded the performance of the corporations it was working with 
against the 10 points uh, of the 10 point plan. And it found that on a scale of zero to five, every single corporation it reviewed was somewhere between zero and one. Uh, that, and, and the problem is really, what does this mean? And if you go then to the Australian situation and you sort of say, well, who in Australia is researching external dependency management? Where is it talked about? Um, and how is it implemented? And in defence, and the ADF in particular, um, I'm confident that this is not managed well, rarely discussed, and therefore not, man yeah, not managed. But the, the, thing that, the point that Chabinsky was making most strongly was that uh, the current technologies are just inherently insecure, and so inherently insecure that we will never fix, we'll never be able to address the problems by current, the current strategy. We have to shift institutionally response, institutional responses, we have to shift technological responses. We need new highly secure technologies. Uh, we just have to do it. Uh, it's really a compelling piece. I don't want to oversell it, uh, but it does speak to some of the uh, issues that allow us to understand what we should do about the North Korean cyber problem. You know, it's okay to sort of think, oh, well, we're sitting here in Australia, we've got a national cyber security strategy, we are one of the least attacked countries in the world, isn't that nice? Uh, it's probably accidental. Uh, but we do have to understand that if the trends are serious, and if serious people are saying, this is what you need to do, and we can say definitively that we're not doing most of it, and we've got malevolent actors out there who are being more malevolent, um, then we've just got to understand that uh, you know, we've got to factor the North Korean thing uh, into all of this and, and what we want for the future. So, beginning to round off, um, there's a set of hearings um, in a subcommittee of the US Armed Services Committee in the Senate on the 23rd of May. And you can see that we're going to have testimony from uh, the people who run the cyber forces in each of the armed services. Uh, and one at the joint level. Uh, I'm calling that out as an example of how seriously advanced, at least in thinking and talking, uh, if not in action, but probably in action, how seriously advanced the United States is, uh, and in a sense where we need to begin to head. And this is a military problem. North Korea is a military problem. Islamic State is a military problem. We've got aircraft in the air operating on the opposite side of poli politics from the Russians in Syria, we need to know cyber military. And so I just really invite people to keep their eye out for these hearings and in a sense see what markers we can take from those for our own policy. And just to finish off, uh, I had a piece in The Strategist uh, just this week uh, talking about uh, where we sit. It's clear the ADF is about to take off. The government has finally unleashed uh, the information warfare uh, uh, objective uh, in the ADF. We haven't really had, I don't think, although there's a classified document which I haven't seen, uh, which may go into this, but I don't think we've, we certainly haven't promulgated widely in the ADF the idea that information dominance uh, should be our, our main sort of strategic direction. Uh, that's a quote from a student of mine I've put up there with his permission. Uh, ab about how he sees the situation and I think it sort of captures it quite well. Uh, and the final point I really want to make is that the reform task we face in the Australian Defence Force but in broader Australian policy in coming to terms with what North Korea in cyberspace represents to us will be very difficult. It'll be long and hard and there'll be no withdrawal. We really just have to work at this and we have to understand not in a sense the bottom-up processes that we've set in train, but we have to understand how what we've set in train matches the seriousness uh, of the threat out there. Uh, and not just for today, because we're at the dawn of the cyber age, what does it look like in 10 years, 20 years time, and how fast do we have to move to keep on top of that? So thank you very much, that's it.